Hello, everyone. <laughs> it is a great pleasure for me to introduce today's uh, speaker, uh, colleague and friend, Johan Knappen, who comes from Tenerife, the Canary Islands. Uh, Johan uh, is uh, was born in the Netherlands and did his undergraduate work at Groningen. Um, then he uh, obtained a fellowship to uh, go to the Canary Islands with the Institute uh, the Astrophysics of the Canary Islands, the EAC, um, where he did his PhD in 1992. Uh, then uh, he did a postdoc at Montreal in Canada, and then returned back to Europe as a lecturer, first as a lecturer at the University of uh, Hertfordshire, where he became senior lecturer, reader, and professor. But his love for Tenerife uh, took him back, so he uh, was offered a permanent position um, at the EAC in Tenerife in 2006, and he is there ever since as a researcher. Uh, his research interests are structure and evolution of nearby galaxies. And um, before telling you about his today's talk, um, we became good friends because uh, Johan was the previous treasurer of the European Astronomical Society. So, so when I became treasurer, you know, whom do you ask for advice? <laughs> the previous one. And he helped me a lot. I appreciate that. So uh, Jochen will tell us today about uncovering galaxy history through deep imaging and machine learning. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for your kind words, Nick. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, nice to meet uh, some of you again who I've met in the past. Uh, and yes, I'll give you in the seminar an overview of some of the uh, aspects of the work that I'm involved in, and it centers around these themes, galaxy history, deep imaging, and machine learning. Uh, so I'm going to give some broad line overviews and then some examples of recent work that we've been doing. I mentioned here some of the collaborators, uh, Regina and Pablo are PhD students, and the others are either uh, postdocs or faculty members. So, oops. Interesting. Why can I not advance the slide? Stop sharing and start sharing. Oh, I can't stop sharing either. Hmm. Stop sharing. Share. Perhaps this one? Just, yeah, that, that one. one. Huh. Yeah, good. Thank you. That was a golden tip. Uh, so I'll start off very generally by talking about galaxy morphology. Uh, galaxies occur in many shapes, and studying galaxy morphology uh, is one of the main tools for understanding galaxies and understanding their formation and evolution. Uh, this dates back many years, of course, many decades. Uh, and, and sophisticated modern approaches uh, include what you see on the left here, detailed classification by eye. This is done by my colleague, Ron Buter, who is one of the experts in this, uh, looking, defeat, looking at the features that you see in, in detailed images and deriving a detailed classification from those. Uh, and then they include uh, looking at components of galaxies and then various degrees of automation. What you see in the middle is one of the perhaps most, uh, most used and most successful uh, applications of, of dividing galaxy images into components. Uh, Consolis then derived his CAS scheme, uh, which is concentration, asymmetry, and smoothness. And with those three parameters, uh, you can classify galaxies in ways that then tell you about the physics of galaxies. And on the right, you see an example of using machine learning uh, to look at galaxy images and again, classify them in, into several uh, classes. Now, one of the aspects uh, of galaxy structure is, is their faint structures, uh, which includes truncations, the ends of the disk of galaxies, thick disks, uh, halos around galaxies, tidal streams that may be results of past interactions, and many others. 
And the main models of cosmological galaxy formation and evolution, for instance, say that interactions uh, and mergers are important in the shaping of current day galaxies. We can find them back through the faint features. Uh, the direct results of these processes, mergers and interactions, include various forms of structure uh, in the outer parts of galaxies, as well as a population of very faint dwarf galaxies. So all this is faint stuff that we can see in imaging. Longer dynamical timescales uh, on the outskirts of galaxies mean that the results of these early processes survive longer there, uh, and the evolution is slower, which makes them good traces of the earlier evolution. But the problem is that deep imaging of galaxies is needed, uh, but this comes with a number of problems. So how can we observe the low surface brightness universe or the LSB universe? There are basically two main approaches. Uh, what you see on the left is star counting. Uh, you look at individual stars and then build up the image of the galaxy from the measures of the individual stars. The advantage is that you can reach extremely low surface brightness levels. Uh, disadvantage is that you can only do this very locally because you need to be able to resolve the individual stars. So it's only available in, in the local universe. It's also slightly dependent on stellar populations. And as an illustration, I put here uh, this picture of, of Andromeda uh, and its neighbors, which is built up from measures of the individual stars, uh, as, as, you, as you can see here. Uh, and you can build up a low surface brightness view of a galaxy as long as it's very nearby uh, from its individual stars. The alternative approach, and what we're doing in our group, is using surface photometry. Uh, so you take an image of a galaxy and, and look at the, at the complete structure of a galaxy. The advantage is that you're not limited to the local group. Uh, you, you can do this at any distance. The disadvantage is, is that it's extremely challenging from a technical point of view. Uh, and what you can see here is an example of a galaxy where the galaxy in the, in the central part, in color, shown in color here, looks like a spiral galaxy, but then as you push deeper into the background of the galaxy, you see this strange uh, interaction result structure appearing, uh, but that is at, at very low levels and technically challenging. Now, this does date back a number of decades, uh, and in the 1980s, David Malan, who worked at the, the AAO, the Australian Observatory, uh, experimented with photographic plates, and he was an expert in preparing the plates, then observing in, with the plates, sitting in the prime focus cage at the telescope for hours, taking these exposures, and then processing the plates. And he got, for instance, this image of M83 uh, as an example. A, a typical standard view of the main galaxy, M83, is on the left, and on the right, there's a, a color representation of the, of the inner part, the bright part of the galaxy, uh, but it, it's embedded in one of David Malan's very deep images. And you can see this surprising outer structure of, of shells and, and features that occur at very low surface brightnesses. So Malan was the expert. He produced these images. Uh, Malan actually wasn't really an astronomer. He was more like a chemist and, and, a, and an engineer. Uh, but he produced these images in the 80s. And then for a number of decades, that's basically where the field remained. Because uh, as we got CCDs, field of view of CCDs in the 80s and the 90s was very small, so we couldn't get there. There were problems with the flat fielding. So this is basically the stages of the field of deep optical imaging of galaxies for a number of decades. But nowadays, uh, we, we, we can move on. Uh, but there are issues with deep imaging. Obviously, the sky brightness, uh, we're looking at a number of magnitudes below the brightness of the sky, so we need to deal with that. Uh, we need to deal with internal reflections, both in the telescope and within uh, the instrument and the camera. Uh, we need to deal with flat fielding, which means that even if you have an, an, a, a, a consistent illumination of your detector, uh, the electronic signal that you get out is not flat, and you need to correct for that. And then once you have an astronomical image, uh, there are lots of uh, sources, both in the foreground and the background, that you need to deal with before you can look at the galaxy of interest. And as, a, as an example, uh, the red dot you see on the, on the right here uh, is an image of a galaxy where the inner part of the galaxy is completely overexposed because for the purpose of this, we don't care. So we look at the outside of the galaxy. The white blobs is where we've masked away background galaxies and stars because there we cannot look at the sky background. And what we have left is 
the background of this image, but you can see there's a gradient from left to right, which we need to correct for, which we do in the upper right. So that's a model to the background behind this galaxy. But to do that, we need to mask out the galaxy itself. Well, then, of course, we need to interpolate the model across where the galaxy is. And once we've done that, we can subtract this and then get the uh, proper background flattened image of the galaxy. This is as an illustration of the kind of steps we need to take. But that's not all, because there's also scattered light. Uh, and as, as this picture that I took in Bolivia illustrates, uh, scattered light is nasty because it, it scatters all over the sky, literally. The blue sky uh, is not limited to where the sun shines. You can see it all over the sky. That's what scattering does. It takes light from one part of the sky and puts it somewhere else. And that also happens in our imaging. So we need to correct for that. And then, and then even once we've done that, we're in our own galaxy and there's nothing we can do about that. So we have galactic cirrus that sits before or in the foreground of the galaxies that we want to observe. Uh, the, the typical depth at which cirrus occurs is 28 and a half magnitude per square second. Uh, and you will see that the images I show you later go deeper than that. So we need to take that into account as well. So these are just some of the, some of the issues that we need to deal with uh, to get to deep imaging. But in spite of that, we can do that. We can go to deep imaging uh, with very careful analysis. And I'll show you two examples of recent results uh, obtained within our group. Uh, the first is on a, what we call a, a giant cold stream uh, in the Coma Galaxy Cluster. Javier Roman is postdoc in our group. Uh, Rich is at UCLA. So this is a paper that's uh, just been submitted. And the second example is a, a, a possible nuclear star cluster in formation, uh, where again, Javier, uh, the postdoc, is the lead author. Uh, Pablo Sanchez Alacón is a, is a PhD student in our group, and Remy Pelletier is in Chromium. So I'll show these as examples of what we can do with deep imaging. Uh, and, and here's number one. So this is the cold giant, uh, the giant cold stream. Uh, the observations, the main observations for this work were done with a 70 centimeter telescope called the JRT, the, the Xiang Rich Telescope, uh, which is a private telescope uh, operated by, by Michael Rich uh, in California. The advantage of having a private telescope, even though it's small, is that you can spend a lot of time observing objects. So the data for this project were obtained during 2019 and 2020. The total exposure time is of order 100 hours, 50 hours per band in two optical bands. Uh, and then we did careful uh, modeling of the scattered light of the point spread function by observing very bright stars and see how their light uh, propagates through the image. And as a follow-up to this work, we obtained 10 hours worth of imaging with a four meter telescope using a luminance filter. And the luminance filter basically means no filter. It takes the whole optical band. And the purpose of using that is to collect as much light in the optical as we can, uh, of course, destroying any color information. Uh, and we can't, we, we can't get that. We, we also destroy the, the, the astrophysical flux information, which is all based on filters. Uh, so we take the whole optical band and in 10 hours, try to collect as much optical uh, light as we can. So that was the follow-up data. And what we found, uh, what Javier uh, did, Javier Roman, he is the expert in this. Uh, on, on the left, this is the, uh, the, the picture that he got of the coma cluster with the Heron, uh, the Heron project. So another advantage that I didn't mention of a small telescope is that your field of view becomes large. So here's a coma cluster. Uh, there are remnants of very bright stars which are sitting here. Uh, they've been mostly removed, and especially their faint uh, outskirts of the PSFs have been removed. So this is the resulting image. And on the right, you can compare it to the same area uh, seen in the legacy data uh, public survey from Decals, which is considered reasonably deep data. And you can see the difference, especially in what we call the inter intercluster light which is all this light that surrounds the main galaxies uh, in the cluster. Uh, you can see that we, we observe a lot more of that in our very deep imaging. Uh, but there's one feature uh, that caught our attention in this image, which is this streak that you see up there. Uh, this is on the left. I'm pointing for those on Zoom. Uh, how do I say this? The left image, there's a, a, a bright uh, reddish remnant of a star, the, the top one. 
and just to this below that and to the right there's a linear streak that you see going towards the lower right that is unusual that is strange you can't see this in, in the in the deck holes image so that's what caught our attention and then we used our follow-up imaging uh, to get a deeper picture of this and it turns out that this looks very much like it is a giant stellar stream uh, of about half a degree long sitting way outside that cluster and you can see that on the inset uh, is linear feature yeah. quite quite featureless there's nothing that you can uh, look in terms of structure within it and again on the bottom right you can see that feature amplified so this is very strange this can is you comment on the surface brightness structure? i will do that in a second yes so there's a couple of things you want to check when you see this kind of stuff the first is whether it could be serous because uh, if there is a serous fragment there that could work so what you see on the left is the optical image at the top with this uh, feature running diagonally across it. And below is, the, is a 250 micron Herschel image of the same region. And the 250 micron usually is a very good tracer of, of Cirrus emission. And there's nothing there. So from that, we conclude that probably it's not Cirrus, yes? What is a galactic Cirrus? Galactic Cirrus is, um, is dust within our own galaxy. Uh, which is distributed in, in various forms, including uh, linear features, wisps, uh, etc. So you see that when, when you take a, a deep image of galaxies outside our galaxy, you will have this imprinted in the foreground. Right? But it's dust within, within our own galaxy. So from the 250 micron imaging, we conclude that there is no that this is not galactic cirrus. Uh, another test we did is to see whether we can resolve this in stars, because it could be something local in our own galaxy. And we can't, uh, it's completely featureless. We do not resolve it in stars. So it's not sitting in the local group uh, around a, a megaparsec in distance. So those are two things that we can exclude. Another thing we checked is whether, uh, if, if it is connected to a galaxy group or a galaxy cluster, whether this thing can sit inside the virial radius of another group of galaxies or another cluster. So what we did is look at all the groups and clusters around this area. The coma cluster is here in the middle in red and little red bar indicates where our, where our feature is. And it turns out that the only, uh, the only virial radius that it can be within is coma. All the other groups, including Virgo here, M94 group, the other galaxies, of course, M94 group. This is four mega, four mega parsec, much closer. But its virial radius doesn't even get close to where our feature is. So our feature can really only be associated with coma. And therefore, we conclude that it's a cold stellar stream associated with a coma cluster, and hence the name that we gave it, which is the giant coma stream. And this thing is over 500 kiloparsecs long. From our Herschel image, our, our 10 hour luminance image, uh, we, we get the stream which you now see vertically. We just reprocess this a bit. Here's the image. Uh, the white blobs in the middle is everything else masked. So all the stars and galaxies are masked out down to very low levels. Uh, and from that image in the middle, we can then deduce uh, a, a brightness profile across the stream. So from left to right. And it peaks at around, this is answering your question, but I see this. This peaks at a maximum surface brightness of about 29 and a half uh, magnitude per square arc seconds in the G band. And then it goes down from there down to roughly 31, maybe 32, 31 would be reliable. So this really is a very faint thing. Um, so an interesting technical conclusion is that we're starting to see features at similar surface brightnesses than the star counting techniques used to be used to have the monopoly on. Uh, but at 100 megaparsec distance. So we can push things uh, this deep now. Now, this is a weird feature as I see, but as I, as I said, but could it, does it occur in modeling? Uh, so two of our colleagues uh, checked the TNG50 modeling, uh, cosmological uh, numerical modeling, and found a feature that looks like our uh, giant cold stream. Uh, and you can see some projections in different planes here on the right of this feature. Uh, and, and especially in the lower of those projections, the, the Z and Y projection, this thing looks uh, 
looks pretty much linear. Uh, it's also long. Uh, so what we claim is that there's an analog to what we found uh, sitting in the TNG50 modeling, which shows us that it, it first of all, it's not, it's not impossible to have these things if you believe these modeling. Uh, but it also then tells you that these giant cold stellar streams could be common uh, in galaxy clusters in Lambda CDM. Uh, just we haven't seen them yet because they're so faint uh, and, and so extended. But we have found the first one. So here's the first example then that I showed you, the, the giant comet stream. Yeah, there it is in the little box on the right. Um, we believe that this is a stellar stream with morphology and brightness similar to the cold stellar streams detected uh, in the Milky Way, but of about 500 kiloparsec length, uh, completely featureless according to the data that we have available. Uh, and, and we'll need future generation telescopes, the ELT, TMT, or GMT, uh, to, to further explore this stream uh, because it's so faint. Uh, are such giant cold streams common in galaxy clusters? Uh, it's a question that we pose now, of course, having found one, uh, who knows how many there are, and then the other question is, what, what can they teach us uh, about the physics of, of, the, of the early universe? So this was uh, submitted. The second example uh, is, is a nuclear star cluster in formation, uh, which does have to do with deep imaging, even though a nuclear star cluster uh, is, is a compact region of dense stars found in the centers of many galaxies, and they, they are bright. Uh, right? They typically contain a few million to a billion stars, sizes of only a few parsecs, and these nuclear star clusters are important because they play a crucial role in the formation and evolution of galaxies. Uh, they contribute to the growth of supermassive black holes. They can regulate star formation. Uh, they may affect the dynamics of the host galaxies. Uh, they probe the early stages of galaxy formation and the physical conditions in the central regions of galaxies. And it turns out that galaxies in denser environments uh, have more of these nuclear star clusters, the fraction uh, of these things is, is higher in, in galaxies as they are in denser environments. So these are interesting uh, beasts, these nuclear star clusters. Uh, they've been known for, for known and studied for a couple of decades. Um, but I'll show you now how this comes to deep imaging. There's two uh, main formation um, pathways for these, for these uh, nuclear star clusters. The first is globular cluster coalescence. Uh, this is widely supported by a variety of observations and simulations, uh, analysis of stellar populations. But the time scale of this is very short. It's the order of a few mega years. Uh, so it's very hard to observe. And in fact, it's not being directly observed yet because it's so quick. And what happens here is that you have globular clusters uh, around the center of a galaxy, and they all come together and then build up the nuclear star cluster. The alternative formation pathway is in situ star formation. So gas that sits in or around the center of a galaxy forms stars, which then coalesce into this nuclear star cluster. <clears throat> now, here's our galaxy, UTC 7346. Uh, it's a bit of a blob on this image, uh, not much to be seen. But if you look carefully, you see some kind of structure and shell-like structure in, in this image. Uh, this is a galaxy that's sitting in the peripheral regions of the Virgo cluster, stellar mass of around 10 to the 9 solar masses, uh, no sign of star formation, there's no gas detected, no H-alpha at all. Uh, it, it's got a bit of a peculiar morphology, uh, maybe some shells or interactions, we'll come back to that. And if you look carefully, which you won't be able to do from where you are in the room uh, in this image, I think, you'll see a number of point sources uh, near the center, pointing out a few of them. And they may be globular clusters. So what Javier did, first of all, is uh, make a two-component decomposition of the radial surface brightness profile. So the profile is shown here. The observed profile is the, is the black profile. And there's two components. There's an inner surset component in blue and an outer surset component or main component in red. And that's a standard technique to model a surface brightness uh, profile of a galaxy. Now, if you take those surface brightness profiles and make them into model galaxies again, uh, the main component gives you this. The secondary component uh, gives you a little uh, central thing there. And if you subtract both of them, uh, you end up at the top right panel and you see some structure 
that is not modeled by these two circuit components. And this structure shows kind of shells uh, in, in, in the near the center. There's also something further out, which you can't really see on the screen, uh, but those on Zoom may be able to see it. Uh, so there is structure in this galaxy, which is not modeled by these smooth circuit components. Uh, and this uh, tends to indicate past interactions of, of a galaxy. Uh, the, the lower right is an enhanced version of the top right panel, uh, just, just cranking up the contrast and using colors to show that there is, there is some uh, structure in there. The second point are the globular clusters, uh, which from our imaging, uh, this is not HST imaging, so it, it, we don't have uh, point sources down to very small uh, radii. But the, the green circles indicate where point sources occur, which also have colors that are uh, compatible with being globular clusters. So we call them GC candidates. Uh, and, and there's two radii indicators here. The important one is, is the red one, which is the effective radius uh, of the main component, which, as we saw, covers most of the galaxy. Now, it turns out that most globular cluster populations in galaxies uh, have typical radii uh, of RGC around the effective radius of a galaxy. That's the norm. So these green points should be sort of around the red circle there, but they're not. They're much further in. They're around 0.41 RE. So this is strongly anomalous. You don't tend to see this in this kind of galaxies. Uh, and then if, if you plot the positions on top of this residual from the modeling that I showed you before, and you have a bit of fantasy, you may be able to agree with me that there is a coincidence of positive flux residuals, which is a sort of yellowish and red light, with the location of the globular clusters. So these globular clusters are sitting much more in the center of this galaxy than they should be compared to other galaxies. And, and with a bit of fantasy, they may also be related to over densities uh, of light within this galaxy. So it's got two anomalies, these galaxies. Uh, it's a dwarf dwarf merger, uh, right? and we see that from the from the remnants uh, that we see in the in the light after we subtract the models. And it's got this concentration of globular clusters. So the question then is: Is the dwarf merger potentially causing the collapse of these globular clusters uh, towards the center? And if it is, is this a nuclear star cluster information? And that is not a, a crazy idea because uh, it, it's been it's been shown that soft tidal perturbations can in fact collapse globular cluster uh, populations and produce a nuclear star clusters. So this was shown in 2000 by Owen Lin that, that this, this can happen. Uh, the, the properties of the hypothetical nuclear star cluster uh, that we would get if all these globular clusters merge in terms of mass and stellar populations, et cetera, they agree with the scaling relations of uh, nuclear star clusters with their host relations. So if our little globular clusters indeed become a nuclear star cluster, that nuclear star cluster would fit right on the scaling relations. Uh, dwarf dwarf mergers are common, uh, and the resulting NSCs would fit the environmental dependence of the NSC fraction. I told you before, if galaxies sit in higher density regions of the universe, their fraction of NSCs uh, is higher. These, these NSCs, nuclear star clusters, become more common. So again, that would fit. Uh, now to test this further, we, uh, we propose some follow-up observations. Uh, we plan to get uh, integral field unit data from the new WEAVE instrument or the Herschel telescope uh, to show the, the kinematic decoupling of our two components, which would be proof of this past interaction. Uh, and, and we're also trying to get high resolution imaging of the globular clusters uh, of that population to push further in that direction. But I show this as an example. It's only one galaxy. It, it's a, a cool case of something new that we found. And I show it as, as this example in the previous one of what we can do by pushing this imaging of galaxies really to the limits, getting this very deep imaging. But as you've noticed, these were two cases, uh, the two galaxies only. Uh, and, all, and both these galaxies have used a lot of, uh, they've needed a lot of work by someone doing detailed analysis of, of these systems, right? making detailed decompositions, looking in detail of, of, of images of, of one galaxy. But we have big surveys coming up. Euclid is gonna launch in July. The LSST survey is gonna start soon. 
And then in principle, we are able to do this kind of work, not for one galaxy, but for hundreds or possibly thousands. Uh, so the question is, how are we gonna do that? Uh, and, and since it's impossible to hire thousands of postdocs, uh, we, we look at the future of astronomy in terms of big data. When did we start? Right. So uh, changing topics slightly, uh, but hopefully having connected this, you know what the megabyte is, you know what the gigabyte is, you know what the terabyte is. Terabyte sits on your desk as an external hard drive. Uh, the Vera Rubin Observatory's LSST will produce of order 20 terabytes of data per night. That's fine. 20 hard disks, you can stack them on your desk. That's fine. Over 13 years' lifetime, you end up with of order 100 petabytes of data. That's a lot of hard drives. The square kilometer array will produce roughly one exabyte of data per second. Uh, although that's raw data. So this is impossible to store. It's impossible to do anything with, except making sure that you stick it all into your correlators. So these are huge amounts of data. To put it in perspective, uh, the total human memory is typically about the gigabyte. That's the estimate that people make of everything that we have in our memory. It's about a gigabyte. One terabyte are about 2 million books, which is a lot to read. I'm glad that I got through a few per year. Uh, two million books is a terabyte. The human bandwidth you can estimate of about a terabyte per year. That's what we get as human as information. Most of that is in video. Almost all of it is a video. It's what we what we see with our eyes. And there's a little bit what we read and a bit what we hear and what we taste and what we feel. But it roughly adds up to about a terabyte of information per year. So the conclusion is looking at these numbers, that we need machines to help us when we're talking about petabytes and exabytes of data. And the tools that we will use are often related to uh, topics called machine learning and artificial intelligence. And this does not happen only in astronomy, of course. Uh, it happens everywhere. For instance, if you want an autonomous car which drives by itself, you'll have to process of order 10 terabytes of data uh, for an eight hour driving shift. So the big data is everywhere. Now, artificial intelligence is becoming very powerful, very useful. It does have dangers and pitfalls. So here's ChatGPT, which you have all heard about, no doubt. Hopefully you've all used it because it's really fun. Uh, this is what ChatGPT says when you open the page. Uh, examples, explain quantum computing in simple terms. Uh, who, who, is you, who have used in this room, who have used ChatGPT? Anyone? Yeah. So you will agree, this is great fun because you give it questions like that and it actually works, right? It, it, gives, you, it gives you reasonable, reasonable answers that, that could be true, sometimes are. Um, capabilities, it remembers what you've said before. Uh, you can follow up, right? You can say, okay, uh, to explain quantum computing in single, sim, simple terms, not quite happy, say, okay, now explain the same, but ask Professor Kilafit to explain it. And then it will give it another go, and you can you can edit your queries, and and it's trained to not say inappropriate things. Uh, limitations. Here's an interesting one. The first, this is what ChatGPT admits. Right? It may occasionally generate incorrect information. Have you guys seen this when you try to you have to see this immediately, right? <laughs> Just invent stuff. It's like Trump. Just bullshit around. Um, there's this paper on archive which you may have seen by by K. Leonard, uh, a PhD student from Ireland somewhere. Uh, he, he explored a certain topic, I think it was quantum physics, and see how much ChatGPT can explain this. Uh, and, and he also asked it for papers of you know key papers in the field, academic papers. And these are some quotes from, from his paper. Uh, however, no such paper exists. The two authors of this supposed paper that ChatGPT came up with, the two authors never published together. And the title is fictitious. Uh, another quote from this paper by Leonard, all the papers it provides have eerily similar titles and not a single one does actually exist. The titles are intriguing. Even the brief, brief summaries uh, sound plausible. And the final thing here, the responses ChatGPT provides sound convincing and rich in detail, even though everything is wholly fabricated. And this, for those of you who've played around with this, this happens. But I asked the thing what my best papers were uh, on star formation in galaxies. And it doesn't know what my best papers are. 
uh, it somehow can't find them. I'm not famous enough, so it, it can't find my papers. But it happily gives me titles and, and invents all kinds of stuff. And then I ask, I, I keep asking, saying, you know, what, what, why was this paper so good? And I listen, I, I hear why this paper that I never wrote has made me so famous. Uh, it's completely made up. If you want to push it, you go that way. On the other hand, I do use it. Uh, and one of the slides you've seen before asked me the questions, which one? That was written by ChatGPT because it does work. It, it's very, very clever. And its grammar and spelling are just perfect. They're really good. Uh, one of the things I use it for is make titles, for instance, for papers. Because we're always struggling with titles, right? You, the words are there, but the, the, it doesn't really sound well. Just ask it to give 50 variations on the same theme. And that will help. But anyway, the, the point of this slide is that we're using artificial intelligence in our work uh, and also in our life. We can't avoid it. It's very powerful, very useful, but it does have these dangers. And we have to be careful also in our astronomy work uh, that we don't fall into these pitfalls that we start believing uh, what these systems tell us. And, and it may be completely untrue. Uh, I'm going to skip this. Skip this. Right. So I'm going to give you three examples of what we do here. Uh, three examples of what we use this kind of techniques for. Uh, one is finding needles in haystacks. Uh, there's that we need to develop new object detection and manifold learning algorithms to deal with, with these low dimensional structures of different dimensionalities which are embedded in noise. This is the kind of stuff I showed you in the first example, this linear feature that's in a very deep image. Javier, my postdoc, found it by eye. Suppose now I want to find a thousand of those linear structures in Euclid data. Uh, that's what a computer can do, but it's finding needles in haystacks because I've got noise everywhere, I've got scattered light everywhere, I've got instrumental effects everywhere, and I still want to find these, uh, these proper objects. Second example is exploring large and complex data sets. Uh, I'm aiming to identify a manageable number of parameters that represent a set of objects. I'll show you an example of what we do here. Uh, for instance, take images, I, I stick to galaxies. Uh, take images of a million galaxies, uh, and I want to reduce that to five parameters. Mass, velocity, evolution, a couple more. Right, so that's what you can try and do. And the third is exploring the intersection of data simulations and computer science. And what we want to do there is uh, have simulations which tell machine learning algorithms what to look for. So which features in a, in a, in a complex or heterogeneous data set are physically relevant. So which features it needs to look for and where these deep learning algorithms can find those features. So you, die, you use numerical models to direct the machine learning into the observations and say, look for this kind of stuff. And this is where you might be able to find it. So examples quickly, because we're running out of time. What time did we start? Uh, what about yeah. 15? Yeah. Good. So you have time. We have time, but not yeah. that much. All right. So the needles and haystacks example I use is where um, we used convolution neural networks, uh, machine learning to identify tidal features in deep optical galaxy images. So this looks a bit like the first example I gave. Uh, these, faint, these are faint structures, they're difficult to detect, but with these new surveys that are coming up, we expect to find orders of magnitude, more of them, but we can't just sit down and look at it by eye. So this is work by Elena Dominga Sanchez. Uh, who used uh, 600 simulated features to train the neural network. She finds that the CNNs work well in recovering these features from the test images, which come from uh, simulations. So it actually works. CNNs work well. You, you put these test images in, they work. But then if you put real imaging in, it does significantly worse to the limit where you can wonder uh, whether this is useful. So if you give it real imaging, and try to reproduce what it did from the from numerical modeling, it fails. And this is probably because the simulated images are not good enough, right? They're not realistic enough. They have lower spatial resolution. They may not include background effects. Uh, they span a wide range in surface brightness limits. Uh, they may not have a uniform redshift coverage. They may not include examples of all the kind of stuff that you may find. And this then is a warning uh, that using CNNs of on upcoming images is not trivial, uh, which, which is a bit of a problem because this is what we wanted to do once we got Euclid and, and LSST images. Show you some pictures. These are at the top. Uh, this is one of our test galaxies, which comes from numerical simulations. 
uh, and we show the image the same the same galaxy but at different surface brightness limits so the, the the shallow image is on the left and the deep version of the same image is on the right uh, and and the little numbers there show number of features and a number of people because uh, we have colleagues looking at these images and classifying etc and it turns out that these numbers vary as you as you vary the images so if you go to deep images uh, there's three features found by the experts and by different people and so so these numbers vary as a function of, of depth of the image uh, and and here's some results so these are what we call true positives shells streams merges so this is where the network correctly identifies what the experts also looked at uh, experts like myself and others looked at these images so the network finds the same and say yes there's a need a shell there and and there are, there are streams here and mergers. So this works fine. These are true positives. The problem are these, these are the false negatives. So this is where the, the network says there's nothing, but the experts say there is something. Yeah, and this is this is of course the problem of false negatives are uh, where your where your uh, software fails. Uh, so as I said, if you do this on numerical modeling, as you see here, it works quite well. So there are not too many of these and, and many of those. If you use it on real imaging, it becomes a, a lot worse. So exploring large and complex data sets. Uh, this is work, which is part of the PhD of the financiamiento with Mark Huerta's company at the IEC. Uh, so where we explore the use of what's called self-supervised uh, deep learning. And we use contrastive learning, which is a self-supervised machine learning algorithm that extracts information from multidimensional data sets. And what it does is it maximizes the agreement between information extracted from augmented version of the same input data. So you take an input data point, you change it, and then it, because it's the same data point, even though you've changed the amplification or the scale or the, whatever the size, it maximizes agreement. And the final representation then is, is invariant to the transformations that you applied. I'll show you this in a second. So this is useful in astronomy, potentially, for removing known instrumental effects in your data uh, and for working with a limited number of available labels. Uh, so there's a review paper that we just wrote on this technique as well. So the input data that Akhina used is uh, data from Manga, which is uh, mapping nearby galaxies at APO, an integral field uh, spectroscopic survey, just part of the Sloan 4. So there's integral field unit data of more than 10,000 galaxies of all types. Uh, and, and what we derive from this in the standard manga pipelines is a V-band image, an H map, metallicity map, line of sight velocity, and a velocity dispersion map. So Rafina used these five maps as input times 10,000 for the 10,000 galaxies and, and used its uh, SIMCLR, which is this, the, the machine learning. So the SIMCLR are on the right in each of these two columns. And on the left with the red cross, that's one of the alternatives, principal component analysis. And what you see here is um, representation spaces, U maps, which each point in these maps is one galaxy. And these have been these maps have been created to optimize the representation of where these points fall in a multidimensional space that we don't know. Uh, this is what the software does. So th these are not physical axes. You're not looking at physical axes here. Right? This is just a, a way to spread these points in space. What is physical is a color coding. So we color coded them on the left in physical parameters. So size at the top, age, the second, no, sorry, uh, lambda is, uh, this is a kinematic parameter. Here's age, the fourth one, uh, et cetera. And on the right are non-physical parameters like the number of fibers, which changes across the survey. Uh, and this is the size of the galaxy, and this is the number of zero pixels. It's the position angle of the galaxy, and there's the right ascension of the galaxy. Uh, and, and what you want to see is on the right uh, that the software is not sensible to, uh, sensitive to effects. So let's look at the top right, which is the number of fibers. Uh, the, the principal component analysis does what it should do and it says oh these these guys here at the bottom right they have a different number of fibers that see lower so these are all the small images that are down there and all the big images are at the right 
Uh, so this is this is an instrumental effect that PCA happily picks up and says, "Oh, look, I found something in the data." Right, small. Okay. Yes. So, but the the x-axis has a physical meaning. No, the axes have no physical meanings. So, so the shape that is being created is no meaning. But why do you have two different shapes? Why between the Be two different methods? If they because they're two completely di different software um, software approaches to determine the parameter space within the data sets. But if the only parameter is the value of the y-axis, how do you decide this? No, behind here are all the parameters that the machine learning derives, which can be a hundred or a few hundred, but we can't see that. We can't visualize a hundred parameter space. So what this thing does is it, it projects the 100 or whatever parameter space into an optimal way to become two dimensional, right? So we don't want all the points together in one pixel because then we wouldn't be able to see anything. It spreads them out, uh, but the axes are non-physical. We can code them with non with physical colors, right? So uh, the fibers, for instance, SimCLR does a, a better job. I'm looking at the top right picture now here, uh, and 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 you see that SimCLR produces reasonably flat distributions on, on the right, which are the non-physical parameters. Whereas PCA finds all kinds of structures there as a function of, for instance, the number of zero pixels or, or the size of, of the galaxy. And then on the left-hand side, uh, SimCLR, for instance, in age, which is the best example here, it puts all the old galaxies at the bottom left, and there's a gradient in age towards the upper right. So it, it reproduces something physical, uh, right? We know what the age is because of the images from manga, of course. It reproduces this and it reproduces more gradients on the physical parameter side on the left than on the non-physical parameter side, which is on the right. Uh, and, and PCA does not do as well. So SimCLR is quite, quite good at this. I, I need to move on. The next thing we can do is do a clustering analysis uh, which I, I won't go into in detail, we can basically identify three groups from the previous plot that we made. Uh, and we let the software choose the three best groups uh, that mo are most differentiated. So these are the, the three dots here, cluster one, cluster two, and cluster three with different colors. And then if we plot those on top of the physical parameters that we know from the data, we can see that they actually uh, start to differentiate galaxies. So the software does find something in terms of mass, star formation rate, et cetera, et cetera. And if you look at the histogram, this is the morphological type distribution of galaxies. And you see that cluster three uh, mostly traces early type galaxies, cluster two mostly traces late type galaxies, and cluster one is sort of in the middle there. Um, so what you do is you throw 50,000 maps into the software, 10,000 galaxies, five maps each. doesn't give it any more information. It doesn't know that it's looking at structure. It's looking at velocity fields. It just looks at pictures, orders them in some way, and it finds something that correlates with, with physical parameters. So that, that's interesting and useful in future. Uh, I need to skip this because I run out of time. And I go to my third example, which was this complicated one. This is, this is the modeling, you know, informing the machine learning, et cetera. This is what we're gonna do in a new uh, Horizon Europe doctoral network, which used to be the ITNs, initial training networks, uh, Educado, which has just been approved two weeks ago. It's coordinated from the IEC by myself. We'll have nine academic nodes, 11 partners, 2.6 million uh, euro budget five astronomy and five computer science nodes, which doesn't add up to nine. It's because Groningen does both astronomy and computer science. This is across most of Europe and the USA. And I want to mention here that we will hire 10 PhD candidates across the network. Uh, calls expected to open around September this year for a PhD start in 2024. So if any of you are students or know students who are uh, interested in applying to us and keep an eye out, uh, we, we're looking to hire people for this. Uh, I'll skip this and I'll get to the conclusions. So these are very general conclusions. Structure and morphology of galaxies yields powerful clues to the formation and evolution. 
Deep imaging is subject to several systematic effects, but with, with care, they can be handled. Faint structures and galaxies can reveal crucial clues to their form formation and early evolution. Major changes are happening in science, including in astronomy, and advanced machine learning and AI techniques can provide physical insights from huge data sets. So that's all. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you for the nice look. Uh, could you go back to the uh, picture where, where you found this cold stream? Yep. Oops. I don't have my mouse, so I'll go like this. Which is the long way. Yeah, this one? Yeah. So um, I'm noticing, for example, in the days, like in the spikes of stars, in the days of the spikes of the stars, Mm -hmm. There are similar features, presumably by uh, because you remove something. Uh, how sure are you that we're not looking at something like this here? Right. Or yep. any other? Good point. The, the, the stellar remnants, which are these sort of red things with little stars in the middle, uh, their remnants, most of the star has been removed by our PSF analysis. And, and what's left are these, these spikes. Uh, you see, uh, and, and they go up, down, and left to right, and only four of them because that's the telescope design. You can see your telescope design. If you use segmented mirrors, you get more of these spikes. Uh, James Webb has many more of these spikes. Uh, so we know there should be only four main spikes, which we see here, and they're exclusively in this direction. All stars go up and down and left to right. Is that that's exactly the, the direction that we're using now? And our stream is in a very different direction. Uh, and if you look at the brightest star, which I think is the one nearest to it, uh, there's nothing that even looks like it or points to the star. Uh, so so it's, it's very unlikely that it comes from, from a star. Or any similar analysis to Some, something else you removed or something like this? Um, no. Thanks. No. Mm -hmm. I had a follow up question. Yes. So, uh, so when you say it's a cold stream, it's a stream of gas that is frozen, or what is it in terms of? It, it's a stream of stars. Yeah. Stream of stars. Okay. Yeah. These are these are stars. Uh, they're not as far as we see that they're, they're not forming stars. These are. Um, it's a stellar stream. Uh, so we think that these are. It's the kind of streams that we see in our Milky Way, uh, which often come from past merger or shredding events. And you end up with these streams of stars uh, going across across our own galaxy or outside the cluster in this case. Uh, we don't know if there's any gas. Uh, we haven't looked yet, but it's it's faint. But I would I would expect this to be, you know, an analogy with what we see in the local group and in our galaxy, I'd expect it to be stellar uh, and, and not more. So with the more sensitive image, you probably start seeing X. You see more like greenish color that you see in the middle or in the middle because they are stars. Uh, I, I, this is really the technical limit at the moment. Uh, but yes, if you were to be able to go a couple of magnitudes deeper, uh, you would see stars again in analogy with what we see in our Milky Way and Andromeda. Uh, these will be old stars. You'd expect these to be old stars, no star formation happening. So they'd be they'd be quite red. Uh, and, and yeah, typical, typical old, not very massive stars. I don't know if you raised your hand earlier. Yeah, the question on uh, on the other galaxies that you that you showed on the nuclear cluster. Mm -hmm. So they you saw the radial profile. Uh, it looked like it had a core. Did it have a core? Mm. Let's have a look. So it has to go on the, the red component. What is the difference between the blue and the red component? The blue component is like the nuclear cluster, and the red component is the galaxy. Or uh... no, these are these are two Sursic fits uh, in the galaxy. Okay. So there's one. There's a main fit, and as you see, that that fits the disk of the galaxy or the outskirts of the galaxy quite well. Uh, but there's a lot more light in the center of the galaxy, which you model with the second Sursic component. So these are basically two disk components with different concentrations. There are not two uh, 
up to the border. No, I think so. I think that I think that through this. Okay. Yeah, this is, sorry, you can see them here. This is the outer one. This is the inner one. All right. Okay. okay. The reason I'm asking is because a good friend of ours, uh, Paolo Bonfini, uh, had written a paper a while ago where the, when you have a merger between two galaxies mm -hmm. and because of dynamical friction, you have sinking of the black holes, for example, in the center of the galaxy, through three body interactions, you actually kick out stars from the center of the galaxy and you form a core. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if the same mechanism may happen here because of the global clusters. Because you don't have now two black holes, you have global clusters, you have yeah. more bodies. So you yeah. have more of these three body interactions. Yes. So you may excavate a, a core in that process. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to it. Uh, I, I think the, the mass has to do, obviously, and the concentration of mass. Um, what I did show here is the reference that, that I mean, this is an established uh, process to form nuclear star clusters. Uh, so, so there is... Maybe, maybe it's true what you're suggesting, uh, but there's certainly a mechanism where you can have globular clusters coalesce and form one central cluster where they're all piled up there. So now, whether we, they also cause a core, I, I don't know. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see what is the profile yeah. after removing the nuclear cluster. Mm -hmm. to see whether the, there is an under density of uh, a star line right. in the center right. minus the yeah. cluster. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, you know, the first presentation, the, the first result on the stream is quite interesting. I can assume you know it better than I do. This type of streams we have seen with the local group extensively, mm -hmm. uh, associated to the work of Lyndon Bell way back on mm -hmm. yeah. with dwarfs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, since you have, but this is fairly large. So, uh, you could, assuming an old star uh, mass to light ratio, you could get a guesstimate on the mass that mm -hmm. is associated with it, right? Yes. It's the distance. So yes, and I think it's in the paper, but I don't remember the number. It, so it, I can I'll can tell you later. Dwarf? Because, I mean, because you don't see, uh, I presume you, there, is no, there is no evidence of sort of like diffuse. H1, for example. No. So it has to be an early type galaxy that was uh, disrupted. Well, the, there's no evidence, but we haven't looked for H1 yet. Uh, so it would be very hard to do anyway. Yes. Because you would, yes. would have the yeah. same problem, yeah. sort of like resolution right. and depth, yeah. the same kind. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. like this part. Yeah. 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 So, okay. So you don't need H, okay. But again, if you compare to a local group, if you, the, you, the plausible thing would be that it will be old stars. Uh, I agree, but I'm just wondering if the mass, because yep. it, it seemed to me if you have it mm -hmm. at that distance and yep. you can actually see it, it would mm -hmm. be very massive. So the question, yep. the question is how easily can you actually describe and then mm -hmm. the, the line? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's less. I think it's dwarf, dwarf galaxy mass, but I'd have to check the paper. I don't remember okay. the number. But in the T and G simulations, as I showed you, the same thing can happen. Uh, so you can, you could trace that back and see where that stream in the simulations comes from, uh, and it, it would probably come from a dwarf galaxy that's been shredded. But I'll I'll find the mass for you and I'll tell you later. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, let me ask one more question regarding the machine learning uh, approach. How much do you worry about the noise characteristics of the actual data? You, you mentioned about discrepancy between the training on the simulation and the application of the mm -hmm. data. Yeah. And uh, we know that each detector has slightly different noise characteristics. Mm -hmm. So how much do you worry about that? Um, after Elena Dominguez Sanchez, well, we, we worry a lot more than before. Oh. <laughs> So, do you have any idea about how to model that and like mm -hmm. include the noise characteristics in the training of the of the model? Uh, working on it, I, okay. I, yeah, that, that's a tricky problem. Uh, we may have to be able, we may have to use the kind of contrastive learning techniques, mm -hmm. uh, where where the instrumental effects are sort of taken out by the by the self learning of the machine learning, uh, which we've shown with the manga data with the fiber size, and so you can do it there. You may have to resort to something like that, uh, but but of course the more of that you do, 
the more you get back to the chat GPG discussion that, you know, the more you're not certain whether what comes out is actually completely true. Uh, so this is, this is not, it's not a simple problem. Yeah. Okay, let's thank you. Uh, Next afternoon, uh, room 227. Uh, if anyone wants to talk to him in private. Yeah. Thank you.